This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Page 106, restructuring. Restructuring costs should be provided only when the entity has an obligation, legal or constructive. It arises where we have a detailed, formal plan and it has been announced. And because it's been announced, it has therefore raised the valid expectation in the minds of those affected. It may be by commencing action or simply announcing the main features, but the public is now aware, or those affected are now aware of what our plans are, and therefore that can create an obligation. Example, on the 18th of August, the directors of Polyus decided to close the Kaunas factory. Assuming no steps are taken to implement the decision, and the decision has not been communicated to any of those affected, what would be the appropriate accounting treatment? Discloses one suggestion. I wouldn't actually disclose. I wouldn't disclose. And if you're not going to disclose, your choices therefore are nothing or provide. Nothing. Why nothing? Because although these directors have made the decision on the 18th, and we're now on the 31st, it could be the case that they change their minds. Until the decision is announced, until the valid expectation has been created in the minds of those affected, then the decision can be reversed. What would be the appropriate accounting treatment for the closure if a detailed plan had been agreed on the 26th and letters have been sent notifying suppliers and we've told our workers that they're no longer going to be needed. Redundancy notice has been sent. So, is there a present obligation? Yeah. Is it legal or constructive? And legal? There's a legal obligation as well, isn't there? There's a legal obligation to pay redundancy money. And there's a constructive obligation in the fact that we have announced and therefore raised the valid expectation. I keep saying this, this is a little, little song for you. It's like the Working Three song. Raising the valid expectation in the minds of those affected. It'd be nice if you could get that into an answer. Raise the valid expectation in the minds of those affected. So we have a legal and a constructive obligation as arising from some past event. What's the past event from which this obligation has arisen? Again? The announcement. The announcement and the sending of notice. The commencement of the plan by notifying suppliers. It's not the decision which is the past event creating the obligation because they could have reversed that decision. It's the sending of the notice to the suppliers and redundancy notice to the workforce. Is it going to involve the outflow of economic resource? Is it? Yes, yes it is because there will be closure costs clearly and there will be redundancy payments to pay. Is that outflow capable of reliable measurement? Yeah, yeah, you can get a reasonable estimate of closure costs and you could certainly calculate precisely your redundancy liability. So yes, it is capable of reliable measurement and therefore it is appropriate to make provision. Provision for restructuring, page 107. Provision for restructuring should include only expenditure directly related to the restructuring and which are therefore necessarily incurred by the restructuring and associated with the ongoing activities. Disclosure for provisions, what would you want to know? Description of the obligation, timing of the outflow, 
how much it's going to cost us. Are we going to get any money back? The government in the UK will contribute towards the redundancy costs. So at the same time you're acknowledging the liability to pay redundancy money, at the same time you can also acknowledge the fact that you're going to receive some money from the government to compensate you for having to pay the redundancy money. I mentioned earlier, just before we get into contingent liabilities, I mentioned earlier the reason for IASs and the uh, Consultative Committee of Accountancy Bodies in the UK. It's made up of all the different branches of the profession. It's the Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, and the Chartered Accountants of Scotland, and the Chartered Accountants of Northern Ireland, and the ACCA, and the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, the Chartered Institute of Public Finance Accountants, and one more, the Association of Professional Accountants and Auditors. So the seven elements of the CCAB, the Consultative Committee of Accountancy Bodies. And many, many years ago, they wanted to know what was the role of accounting standards in determining truth and fairness. They paid a lot of money. I'm talking maybe 30 years ago. They paid a lot of money to the legal profession, or two people in the legal profession, for their professional legal opinion. It was something like 40,000 pounds they paid, which 30 years ago was a substantial amount of money. Not so much now with the pound falling, but nevertheless it was a, a lot of money then. And one of the expressions that this two, this team of barristers came up with was that they said that accounting standards reduce the penumbral areas of divergent possibilities. That's what they do. That's what IFRS and IAS do. They reduce the penumbral areas of divergent possibilities. Nice if you could get that into an answer. Why was it necessary to issue IS 37 provisions and contingencies? To reduce the penumbral areas of divergent possibilities. It says it all. did have a student two or three years ago, a colleague of at least five of you, and a former colleague of one or two others as well. And she remembered this expression. It came out of the advanced auditing exam. She said, I got it into every single audit answer. Every single one. She had accounting standards reducing the penumbral areas of divergent possibilities. Even in one where it was clearly not applicable, she actually said it's not applicable that accounting standards reduce the penumbral areas of divergent possibilities, but it's in every one of her answers. And she qualified straight through. Didn't lose her any marks or didn't cost her a qualification. So if you can get that into your answers, you might find that the marker has to go to his dictionary. It's uh, divergent is not a common word in English. Do I have to say any more? I'm not going to say anything if you don't ask. Okay, let's move on then. Page 108. I can't believe that the standard of your English vocabulary is sufficient to know what the word penumbral is. No, it's nothing to do with number. It's nothing to do with number at all. It's more to do with um, umbrellas. It's the same root as the word umbrella. What does an umbrella do? It protects you from the rain, but what else does it do? It protects you from the sun. It gives you shade. 
and the umbra is shade. And penumbral is effectively, therefore, shady. And what you're looking at is a situation of accepting that that's the world of true and fair. And therefore, outside this world of true and fair, it's not true and fair. But we don't have it like that. It's not like that, is it? Surely when you get to the outer limits of truth and fairness, it's a shady line, it's a wiggly line. It, that might not be true and fair in some person's eyes, but may be true and fair in others. But equally, that might be true and fair in some people's eyes, and not true and fair in others. So the shady areas, the penumbral areas, and as each IAS or IFRS, as each accounting standard is issued, it draws a line and says that side is true and fair, that side is not true and fair. So it reduces the shade, it reduces the uncertainty, it gives certainty to accounting treatment of matters within financial statements. Of course, having reduced these penumbral areas, you then find that in fact some accounting standards will have benchmark and allowed alternative. So some accounting standards actually build in a penumbral area. They say you can do it this way or this way. An obvious one will be with cash flows. You can either use the direct method, which is the benchmark, or the indirect method, which is the allowed alternative. And even within cash flows, you can put some items high up or you can put them lower down. So some accounting standards actually build in divergent possibilities. Another one is leasing where the word significant is used. Well, what's significant? Is it significant in your head or maybe not significant? Something significant in my mind might not be significant in yours. Is one mark in the exam, is it significant? One mark in the exam, is that significant? Certainly is if you've got 49. It's very significant then. So, this reduction of the penumbral areas of divergent possibilities, if a question should ever be asked, whether it be auditing or accounting, and says, what is the role of standards, audit standards, accounting standards, what is the role of standards? And then one of the roles is clearly to reduce the penumbral areas. Okay, page 108. Not many people will know, seriously, very, very few people in the UK will know what the penumbra is. It's uh, to do with um, uh, the sun, the way you have the, the sun and the moon is covering it, so you've got an eclipse, and then you've got this little bit around the edge there, that's also penumbra. It's the effect of the moon shading the sun or covering the sun up. Okay? But I don't know... I don't think even my sisters, who are both English teachers, I'm not sure that they would know what penumbra was. Contingent liabilities, either. They're possible obligations from some past event. Listen, big difference here in the use of sumulurish words. These are possible obligations. Provisions are probable obligations. A line. Reducing the penumbral areas is divergent possible. We'll come to, I'll tell you what the difference is. One is probable. Oh, you know the difference between possible and probable. A probable is the chance of it happening is greater than the chance of it not happening. Alright, so, so higher than 50%. Sorry? Yeah, is it, is it there? Or, yeah, and you, you ask a legal opinion of the company's solicitors and they say, oh, there's a 50-50 chance, which is the answer you don't want. Because if it's exactly 50-50, it's neither probable nor possible. It's just yeah, somewhere in between. 51 would make it probable. 49 would make it possible. So you don't want people to say it's a 50-50 chance. So these are possible obligations arising from some past event, the existence of which 
will only be confirmed by the occurrence or non-occurrence of some substantially uncertain future event, not wholly within our control. Present obligation, which is not recognized, so it's or, a contingent liability, is a present obligation involving probable outflow, but we've not recognized it because it's not capable of reliable measurement. Or it won't involve the outflow of economic resource. Contingent liability disclosure, what do you want to know? The nature of the contingent liability, the estimate of its financial effect, the uncertainties which will determine whether it's an obligation or not. And if you can't estimate its likely financial effect, then an explanation why you can't. What is it that's stopping you quantifying the potential liability? Justina supplies fish to a local restaurant. In August she supplied the restaurant with some shellfish, oysters, mussels, scallops, that sort of stuff. She supplied the restaurant with some shellfish and now she's heard that some of the restaurant's customers have suffered attacks of food poisoning. They went to the Stella bar. The restaurant has claimed that this is because of Justina's shellfish and has commenced a legal action against her. Algirdas, a local solicitor who specializes in food poisoning cases, has advised her that she's got a 42% chance of losing the case. And if she does lose, she'll probably have to pay around 300000 to settle the liability. What's the nature of her liability? And how should it be treated in her financial statements? To save you using your calculators, I'll tell you that 42% of 300 is 126. Tell me again. Possible. possible. It's possible. So what are you going to do? Contingent, treat it as a contingent liability and disclose it. Disclose it. A full disclosure note. The directors received in August notification from a restaurant, a customer of ours, that they're holding us liable for poisoning their customers. Don't think you probably use the word poisoning. It's a little bit dramatic. Killing maybe would be better. We have been advised that we have a 58% chance of winning. It sounds rather more positive than a 42% chance of losing. A 58% chance of winning the case, and no liability would accrue in that circumstance. However, we're also advised that if we are to be found liable, then we have a potential liability of 300,000. Just communicating. Be open, be honest, be transparent. Be accountable and responsible. So, full disclosure. Contingent assets, that's interesting. When I was at your level, there was no such thing as contingent assets. You only recognized an asset or an income if it was actually achieved, a profit if it was actually achieved. But there is a possibility that we should recognize an asset which is not actually achieved. It's virtually certain, but it's only virtually certain. It's not 100% certain. Provision for restructuring costs. Oh, wrong page. Am I on the right page? Where am I? Page 109. Contingent assets. Possible assets arising from past events. A possible. Probable. Possible. Possible. Asset arising from past events, the existence of which will only be confirmed by the occurrence or non-occurrence of some substantially uncertain future event. Not wholly within our control. Shouldn't recognize contingent assets. It could result in the recognition of profits which may never be realized. But if the profit is virtually certain, then the asset is no longer contingent. It's virtually certain. And in that situation, then you would recognize it.
Additional issues. A company may be jointly and severally liable for an obligation. If we're in partnership, if you and I are in partnership, then I'm liable for your actions. If me, a company, and you, a company, are in partnership, and why not? If two companies are in partnership, then the actions of one company creates a possible obligation on another company, the, the partner company. Because I have joint liability for your actions. Equally, you have joint liability for my actions. So if one company enters into a transaction or causes some loss to a customer, and we're in partnership, then you're equally liable as me. And if I declare myself bankrupt, then you take on the whole of that responsibility. So an entity may be, entity may be jointly and severally liable for an obligation. Severally. Joint and several liability. Do you remember that from your law days? Do you remember anything from your law days? Yeah, joint and several liability. Good. If so, we will provide or recognize to the extent of our own liability. So you would recognize the amount, your share of the obligation, and you would disclose the other partner's share as a contingent liability. Contingent upon them not being able to pay. I have to pay my half. I possibly have to pay your half as well. Can you aggregate into a class of provisions or contingencies? Yes, you can, so long as they're sufficiently similar. So Justina, with her fish, she has an obligation to compensate individual poisoned people. But she can aggregate them and say, in the event that I lose, it's going to cost me 300. It's not going to cost me 15, 15, 15, 50. It's going to cost me 300. But it's not appropriate to aggregate, for example, uh, contingent liabilities of a different nature. A warranty is rather different from a guarantee. It's a legal distinction. But a warranty is different from a guarantee. And so contingent liabilities arising under warranties could be aggregated together, but couldn't be aggregated with guarantees. Continue review. Contingencies change over time. They may exist from one year to the next. So continue a review to determine continuing appropriateness. Where probability changes during an accounting period, necessary adjustment will be reflected in the financial statements. If we already did have a provision, and now we need to increase it, then only the increase will go through the income statement. And the increased figure will then appear on the statement of financial position. Only the movement in the year will go through this year's income statement. Reimbursement may be sought from another party. Justina could have done. Justina could have held the fishermen liable. The people who sold her the shellfish. If these shellfish are shown to be poisonous or carry salmonella, if that were the case, and she could show that nothing she has done in the storage or keeping of those shellfish, nothing she has done could, could have resulted in the shellfish being poisoned by her, then she should be able to hold her supplier liable. If it's virtually certain that she's going to be found liable, she will herself have taken action against her supplier. And it would be virtually certain that she would get compensation from the supplier. So you'd have a contingent liability provision, but you'd also have a virtually certain contingent asset. A virtually certain asset. Reimbursement may sought from another party if so recognize the provision for the full amount and disclose the potential reimbursement. You've got that summary in table form. <clears throat> Virtually certain, probable, possible, and remote. 
And there is a balance to this. There is a symmetry. It's a skewed symmetry, but it is a, a symmetry. You'd recognize and recognize and recognize. You'd disclose and disclose. You'd ignore, ignore, ignore. And the symmetry lies in the diagonals. Or in that form. I'm a driver, I have third liability insurance. Do I need to disclose that I have a car and potentially I'm going to run people over? I'm a, yeah. Well, give me the question again. If we have an insurance policy, which our company pays for every year, yeah. and insurance policy covers cases like this, yeah. do we still have a provision? Or is it a probable obligation involving the outflow of economic resource? If your insurance, if, if your insurance company covers you for the full potential loss, then you're not going to have any economic resource outflow. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't fall within this IS. You're welcome. So you've got that symmetry. The only thing you have to remember is that it's gains on the left and losses on the right. Put it the other way around and you do that symmetry, you get it totally wrong. Okay? Little asterisk there in virtual certain and probable liabilities. The little asterisk there says you would recognize it as a provision, but if it's not capable of reliable measurement, then you can't. So the only thing you could then do is disclose it. So these two possibles, these two virtually certain loss and probable loss, will come down into this level of possible loss, and they would then be disclosed. But in addition, you'd have to disclose the reason why you couldn't reliably measure. Ginza is an Australian mining business. This happened in um, Romania. That an Australian mining company was found liable and guilty of, apparently in gold mining, you use um, a poison, and I'm not sure if it's arsenic or strychnine, I'm not sure which one it is, but they had this, this poison uh, at their mine, and for whatever reason, I don't know if somebody tipped it over and it went into the Danube or Somebody rolled a whole canister of it into the Danube. But the strychnine was then in the Danube. And, and this are high up in the, the hills, the Carpathian Mountains. Uh, and, and the Danube was therefore poisoned. How long do you think it would take for the effect of that poison to wear off and become so dilute that it then has no effect at all? Well, funnily enough, I was in a bar one evening in Bucharest. And I was talking to an Australian miner who worked at an Australian mining company. I don't know if it was the same one. But he was telling me that the effect of that poison would have been negligible. It would have disappeared. The effectiveness of it would have disappeared within a hundred meters. But the Romanian government found them liable and said, you've been poisoning our river and we're going to fine you a million dollars. Now, what choice do you have as an Australian mining company when the Romanian government says you're going to pay us a million dollars? You don't really have a lot of choice. But anyway, that's what this, this example is based on. Against an Australian mining business was fined 130000 by the Lithuanian government for polluting the River Neris. Same as is about to pass new legislation, same as is Parliament. They're about to pass new legislation which will require Australian miners to clear up their mining sites and to change the mining processes in order to avoid a repetition of the river pollution incident. We've got three elements now. We've got the fine, the cost of clearing up the site, and the cost of changing the mining process. So what's the correct accounting treatment? First of all, for the fine. Is there a present obligation? 
Yes, there is. Is it legal or constructive? It's legal. Arising from some past event. Tell me what the past event was. Actually, I don't think it was poisoning the river, was it? I think the past event is the fact that the government has said, you will pay us. That creates the obligation to pay. All right, Poisoning the river, if nobody had found out, then the obligation would have washed away in the river. So it's the fact that they were found out, and the government has said, you will pay us 130. So that's the, the past event. Is this going to involve the outflow of economic resource? Yeah, yeah. Is it capable of reliable measurement? Yes, it's 130,000. So what's the appropriate treatment? Yeah, provide for it. What about the cost of clearing up a mining site? I think you've actually got two possibilities here. Two possible solutions to this question. The cost of clearing up the mining site. Is there a present obligation? No. The same as is about to pass new legislation. So there isn't a legal obligation. So the rest of the conversation is irrelevant. Is there a present obligation? No. Legal or constructive? Not applicable. Arising from some past event? Not applicable. Outflow of economic resource? Not applicable. Capable of reliable measurement? Not applicable. But, but, is there a present obligation? It is possible. It is a maybe. They may have got a reputation. They may have a constructive obligation. It's a constructive or possible that they have a constructive obligation. You'd have to raise it. If this were an exam question, you would have to raise the possibility that they have a reputation and therefore a constructive obligation. So, if they do have a present obligation, brackets constructive, does this arise from past events? Yes, it does. It arises from the fact that they've built up this reputation. And will this obligation to clear up the site, will this involve the outflow of economic resource? Yeah. And is that capable of reliable measurement? I suppose it depends on how experienced this Australian mining business is. If they've done lots of minings over many years, then they would have a fair idea how much it's going to cost to clean up the site. But on the other hand, if they're new at the business, then they have no experience, then oh, they should still be able reasonably to estimate it. I think, yes, they probably would. So if there were a constructive obligation, then I think you would provide. What about the costs of changing a mining process? If this new legislation goes through, then she's going to have to change her mining processes. She's going to have to change the equipment, the machinery, the way things flow through, the way she digs or explodes, or however she gets the, the gold out of the, the land. So how is she going to treat the costs of this changing mining processes? Is there a present obligation? No, there isn't. If Samus does pass this new legislation, then she may just say, I'll walk away. I will no longer continue to mine in your country. So there is no obligation, neither legal nor constructive. What if Samus has already passed the legislation? If the government has already just passed legislation requiring mining companies to amend their mining processes, now do we have a present obligation? Legal or constructive, arising from some past event, involving the probable outflow of economic resource capable of reliable measurement. Hilsa? Depends on the on our decision. 
depends on our decision. We don't have an obligation. We can walk away. We can choose no longer to continue mining, in which case there's no need for us to adapt to our mining process. So, even though same as may have passed law, there's not an obligation. Page 113, leases. One of the characteristics of a set of financial statements, which you read, I think, in chapter 2, you read it last night and the night before. So one of the characteristics you will remember is the characteristic of substance over form, and leases are the classic example. If I lease an asset, it's not my asset. It belongs, the ownership remains with the lessor. If I have an asset and lease it to you, it's my asset. You will pay me money on a regular basis because I'm letting you use it, but it's my asset. And legally, it will remain my asset until at the end of the lease, there may be a clause within the lease that says, uh, at the end of five years, you have the option to buy and you do exercise that option, then it becomes your asset. But until then, it's mine. And if it's my asset, I should be depreciating it. But in fact, leases, the classic example of substance, rather than strict legal form. Strictly, legally, it's mine. But in commercial reality, substance, it's really your asset. You've got the freedom of use. You've got substantially the whole of the risks and rewards of ownership. You can access that asset at any time, day or night. You can use the asset in your production process. And the benefits of what you have produced, you can sell that and keep the money. So that asset is, in effect, it's your asset. Legally, it's mine. 